Hello, everybody, and welcome to Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network. And you could also find me on theconsciousresistance.com and theseedsofliberty.com. So today we have Prof. CJ uh, from Prof. CJ's Dangerous History Podcast. Uh, you can find him on profcj.org, profcj.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and he's also got his uh, podcast on iTunes and Stitcher. Uh, please check him out. He's got some really awesome content, um, history that uh, you definitely were not <laughs> taught in government school. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I want to get into some of the episodes that I heard of of his that really, um, really impressed me. Um, one, one of them was uh, his conversation with Daniele Bolelli, uh, which I never heard of the guy before, but uh, is a great conversation on Taoism. And um, and Lao Tzu and things like that. And then um, he did a great series on the Revolutionary War, uh, five part series, and then Shay's Rebellion and the Whiskey Rebellion. All fascinating topics to get into. So, um, Prof, Prof CJ, thanks a lot for coming on the show. Hey, welcome. It's great to be here. Yeah, yeah. I, I heard about you. Um, uh, actually, Dave from the Seas of Liberty. I think he contacted you first, right? And we we had you on there, and I'm like, wow, this guy. I gotta get this guy on my show. <laughs> really, really fascinating person. You know, you know, you don't find too many um, like anarchist um, historians. You know, I, I mean, I guess Murray Rothbard would be considered one, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Tom Woods. Tom Woods, right, right. But uh, but it's really it, it's really great, and and um, I, I think it was you that said on the Seeds of Liberty that. That you you said you don't understand how some people can can uh, you know critically analyze history and not become an anarchist. Did you uh, you said that right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I I really I, I guess it's because that's how how I eventually came to this conclusion is I just spent so many years studying history and I was not an anarchist when I started studying history, um, and I and I kind of gradually moved closer and closer to that position until I finally just sort of surrendered to it, but. I mean, my my path to it led right through years and years and years of studying history, and I I still don't understand. I I mean, I I understand in a way, intellectually, I understand how people can choose to cling to beliefs that don't make sense. You know, um, there's there's lots of science that that explains how this works, and and you know some of the things in the human brain that make it do this. But still, at the end of the day, it's like, man, if you study history, and it's just, you know. One atrocity after another, one one jerk in power ruining things after another. Um, you would think more people would would eventually come to the conclusion of maybe we shouldn't have rulers. Well, I think uh, <laughs> people look at history and they're like, "Wow, that must have been brutal, you know, wicked times." Thank God we live in the modern age <laughs> when we're all civilized. Sure, <laughs> and that doesn't happen anymore, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, they're <laughs> they're doing great work over in Syria I hear right. to make history come back. <laughs> yeah, pleasantly overlook the, the the atrocities that are committed in the name of government, right? Those aren't considered murder, right? It's just war. It's just, you know, collateral damage, right? <laughs> yeah, and and one of the ways that you get this and and this is I think holds true even looking way back at ancient history is a lot of the times just certain people are left out of the story and usually those are like average people who are just you know, trying to raise their family and take care of their farm or whatever. And you hear about, oh, Alexander the Great's doing this and Genghis Khan's doing that and Julius Caesar's doing this. And like, you don't hear about, you know, the 99% of people who are just getting, getting crushed, who are just pawns in their games. And uh, man, when you start to just even think about that, you realize a lot of these people that we're told are great are monsters. They're absolute monsters. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the word great, like, yeah, like you said, Alexander the Great is more probably like uh, Alexander the the evil or the, or the wicked. Oh, yeah, yeah, the psychopathic control freak, you know. Right, right. Give, give him whatever, whatever label you want, but, you know, great. I do not think it means what you think it means. <laughs> exactly. So, so before we get into um, uh, those topics, can you uh, delve into a little bit of your past and, and how you how you got to um, to anarchism and volunteerism, um, and you know, you know, how was your path and the things that you studied? Yeah, well, basically, I came from a predominantly right wing family. Um, some of them more right wing than others, but um, th there, other than a, than a few maverick weirdos <laughs> who are lefties, there it's mostly you know staunch Republicans and whatever in my family. 
And, and I grew up with that. So, you know, everybody just gets, gets uh, buried with, with whatever they're raised with. But even, even as a teenager, I was already starting to realize that there were problems with this. Um, probably one of the first things that I started to think was, was BS was the war on drugs. I started to just look at the war on drugs and, and it made no sense to me that you would, you know, throw somebody in prison just because they want to use a substance that, you know, some other people don't think they should use. Mm -hmm. And so that, that was kind of like the little opening, you know, crack in, in, in the basic, you know, mindset I was raised with. Um, and then when I was in college was when, when nine 11 happened and, and the war on terror and all that. And, and at first when it happened, I was kind of swept up in the, Oh man, we got to, you know, get these guys and whatever. Um, but it didn't take long observing how everything went down and, and how, you know, the, the government just went so crazy uh, with the Patriot Act and then with invading countries like Iraq that clearly had nothing at all to do with with the attacks and, and how bad that whole thing went that um, I kind of threw out my my attachment to to the right and sort of became kind of a mild uh, Gary Johnson libertarian sort of a, you know, for, for lack of a better term. Um, and, and then it was just a matter of probably four or five years of reading increasingly radical stuff. Um, and, and I never had the moment where I never had the one Eureka moment where I said, Oh, that's it. I've, I've given up on the state entirely. Um, it was, it was a gradual process. It, it took years and, and lots of, lots of reading, lots of learning. Um, and just somewhere along the way, I just sort of shed, shed those beliefs and just, I just can't, I just can't, you know, do this anymore. I can't, I can't believe these things anymore. So, um, yeah, and history was a was a huge part of it, probably the the major part. Yeah, you know, you know what um, what stood out to me when you when you were saying that is um, is how you said it took many many uh, you know books and reading and articles and and maybe uh, I don't know if you, did any YouTube personalities or or podcasters affect you in your development. Um, I, I definitely had podcasts I listened to, although. I think by the time I started getting big into podcasts, I was already most of the way there. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So one of the things I observe is that, you know, most um, anarchists and, and voluntarists are extremely well-read, you know, <laughs> and as compared sure. to their, uh, you know, Democratic or Republican <laughs> counterparts who function most yeah, on feels yeah, and I, emotions and all that. <laughs> yeah, I'd be interested if, if anybody did a study of, of uh, IQ IQ versus, you know, the degree of statism. Is there a correlation there? Because you don't meet very many um, <laughs> anarchists who are who are just dumb, you know, who are who are not intelligent and who are not at least relatively well read, you know, compared to the general average person. Meanwhile, there's just a lot of dumb statists out there. Um, now. It's not to say that they're beyond hope because, of course, right. I was one. I, I don't know if I'm, – I'm guessing you were at some point uh, back in your past a statist. Mm -hmm. So you know, I try to remind myself of that, that like it did take me a bunch of years mm. to, to give up on what I was inculcated with. So it's one of those things. You know, we, we all tend to fall prey to the whole so much smarter than everybody else and you know, I do it too. But then I think I was one of those people for a while. You know, so yeah. yeah, yeah. I think it was a uh, Malcolm X quote. He says, um, "You know, you shouldn't be quick to condemn other people for the things they didn't know, because there was a time when you you didn't know what you now know." <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm sure if you went back enough years, I'd be the dunce going. But what about the roads? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I mean, my past. I I came from a um, a Democrat family, and uh, um, so you know they support every, every any Democrat. <laughs> The candidate or president, and but but the thing is, I wasn't I wasn't really intensely passionate about politics. For the most part, I really was indifferent to politics. Mm. I didn't care about it. Um, you know, I was into like uh, you know chess and piano, philosophy, Eastern philosophy, Western philosophy, Taoism, um, and then alternative medicine, things like that, um, Eastern nutrition, and then uh, and slowly I uh, got um, interested in nutrition, and I learned about you know. The, the corruption with the um, you know FDA FDA and 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 Monsanto you know big farm all that kind of stuff and vaccines and and slowly you begin to you know examine you know well if if the if the pharmaceutical company is corrupt because it has you know 
ties with with government, with, you know, with lobbyists and with subsidies and favoritism, then what about everything else? <laughs> what about yeah. the big banks? What about you know every, everything else, special interest groups? So, so I kind of got into it like that, and uh, and I didn't really care about voting, although I, I did vote for um, Obama because my mother was a Democrat. She's like, vote for Obama, so I voted for Obama. <laughs> didn't really know what I was doing, but yeah. You know. so, so I always say that, like, in, my last time voting was two thousand eight, and um, and you know. That's it. You know, you, you, you make mistakes in your past and, uh, you know, you uh, learn from your mistakes and you try not to repeat them. So I think that's what we can. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I try to, you know, just always whenever I, I catch myself like, you know, getting the attitude of disdain towards towards people, I think, well, some of them are beyond hope. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you know, you never know. And I've I've had some surprises. You know, I've had some people that that I, I thought would never you know, get better ideas, um, and, and did. And, you know, I don't know if I should take credit for, for any of those or what, but, uh, <laughs> sometimes people do surprise you. Yeah, I do. I do get the feeling when I listen to your podcast that you are, you know, you're, um, you're a patient person and that you're very well articulate, articulate person. And so I think that in itself, um, makes your, your philosophy attractive, right, to people. If they feel like, you know, you're a calm person, you're not going to attack them for being, you know, having a different opinion, right? Uh, what do you think? Yeah, I, I think it, it comes from what I've been doing for almost 10 years now, which is teaching history to primarily 18, 19-year-olds most of whom don't really want to be there <laughs> because they're just taking the class because it's punching out a gen ed credit. Um, you know, the vast majority of people coming through my classes are not history majors. Um, not that many of them are particularly interested in history, in part because they probably had nothing but terrible history classes uh, throughout grade school. And so, you know, I've, I've got to deal with that. And the way I think of it, and maybe I'm just, you know, trying to make myself seem a lot cooler than I am, but it's sort of like <laughs> when the when the Beatles were in Hamburg, right? And uh, and and the Beatles, I, I think they were playing at like a bar or a strip club or something in Hamburg, and they had to play like every night of the week um, to you know hard drinking German audiences who weren't necessarily there primarily for the music. <laughs> and you know, whenever you hear the, the the Beatles talking about how they got to be such a successful band. Um, they always talk about the Hamburg experience, how it was, it was grueling, um, but it, it forced them to have to, you know, perform It forced them to have to, mm. to deal with it. And so, you know, that, that's probably shaped, uh, my approach and, and how I deal with things. I, I've got to, I've got to keep my patience, even when students occasionally say something that's just incredibly, incredibly dumb or whatever, <laughs> um, you know, just develop the, the way to kind of tease it out and, maybe Socratically kind of get them to realize uh, that their idea has flaws. So, so can you give me an example of a, of a, a, a quote, dumb thing that a student ha has said to you? <laughs> oh, um, no, I, I don't have one handy. There hasn't <laughs> been one in a while, okay, that's, honestly. Okay, that's good then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, there's been a, well, there was this one, yeah, th this is one that made me kind of despair um, <laughs> about the future for a while. I actually did have a have a student one time, and this was a long time ago. This was towards the beginning of when I started teaching. I had a student that were covering World War II, and I started to talk about Japan. And no joke, student raises her hand and asks me, "What does Japan have to do with World War II?" <laughs> how you? How you got to be 19 years old and in college, which means somebody somewhere must have thought you were worthy of a high school diploma. Right. And, and I understand not everyone's an expert in World War II, but like <laughs> you would at least know Japan was in it. Right, right. You know, you know the other thing that I was listening to your Danelli um, Bolelli uh, interview, and one thing he was saying, uh, or, or I'm not sure if you said this also, but how, you know, history... It can be a fascinating thing to learn about, you know. It's 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 like it's really exciting. It's like better than a movie if you have the patience to read and and uh, actually you know analyze what's going on. It's a really fascinating thing. But then there are also some people who can make it so extremely mind numbing, <laughs> yeah, and boring that you yeah. want to kill yourself. 
Yeah, that and that's a lot of the formal academia, unfortunately. Um, you know, think about some of the most popular stories in modern times, right? Star Wars, um, Lord of the Rings, Harry Potter, Game of Thrones, mm-hmm. um, The Sopranos. I mean, just think of any and, – and these are complex stories – and yet they have millions of fans who like know every detail yeah. and who who just you know <laughs> lap it up and and are and and I'm I'm fans of a lot of those things that I just said but it, the the fact that there aren't as many people who are who are avid uh, fans of history is not the fault of history because it, it is a bunch of stories that are just as interesting uh, and violent and dramatic and tragic and sometimes uh, comic as as any of those those movies or works of literature or whatever and the fact that not as many people are interested in history just shows that it's oftentimes not told in a in a very interesting fashion you know they they pick the most boring stuff to zero in on in a lot of academic history um not not that i think we should always be choosing what what we look into just based on what's interesting mm. but I mean, at a certain point, if if what you're what you're teaching and sharing with your students and what you're writing articles and books about isn't interesting, what do you, why are you doing it? <laughs> you <know>? Right. <laughs> it's like, do I even have to ask, ask that question? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I, maybe it comes down to some people just find things interesting that ninety nine percent of the rest of the world thinks are boring. But right. I I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, another thing that that uh, came to mind is um, you know you know Stefan Molyneux has this series, The Truth About, right? And he he picks various people and he just you know goes through their entire lives. And uh, you know he's done like um, George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, uh, Martin Luther King, Gandhi, uh, you know some some fascinating people. And one one thing that one of the common themes of that, which I really like, is the fact that um, he 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 really tries to discourage hero worship, right? Which um, it seems like they do a lot in government school. <laughs> you know, there are certain people that are just untouchable, right? That are just impeccable people <laughs> that we must idolize, right? Because because they wrote on a piece of paper, I am your ruler <laughs> and you must pay taxes to me, <laughs> like, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or because they, they uh, you know, killed enough people somewhere along the line. Right. I mean, generally the in in those polls and whatever that rank the presidents the ones that are ranked the greatest usually are the ones with the highest body count right and and the ones that are ranked you know mediocre or even bad are the ones who didn't get that many people killed you know i mean everybody everybody reviles warren harding and um considers calvin coolidge mediocre um you know i don't i don't think these are necessarily good guys but compared to people who who bomb millions of innocent villagers to death in some third world country i'll i'll take a a lovable buffoon like warren harding any day (laughs) yeah 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 i mean abraham lincoln is major major idol worship in in many people's eyes um and uh and then you have like even you know now with obama so people are like what you know when, when obama was elected and you know all the most of the black population are like yes victory <laughs> we have a black man <laughs> sure you know as if as if you know things are going to change because he's black right the, the pigment of his skin or or it's, it's like i feel like that you know hillary has a big chance of winning just so the women can say yes finally a victory <laughs> for <us>. yeah <laughs> right <laughs> yeah yeah and, and nothing nothing substantive ever seems to really change at least not in a good way no no, definitely not. I mean, uh, things, uh, yeah, progressively get worse. Um, but, uh, but yeah. So, 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 why don't you? Um, can you tell us a little bit about? Uh, let's let's go into some of the rebellions because um, I mean, the Revolutionary War is fascinating, but it's, it's really complex, <laughs> you know, yeah. um, area. But but what's what's fascinating is even afterwards. So you know, the the, the revolution is over, and although actually, can, can you go into a little bit of? of uh, you, you did an episode on why. You you were you didn't think it might not have been considered it or, or or it could not have been considered a revolution, right? There are many factors for that. Yeah, yeah. This is something that actually um is is one of the arguments that academic historians have that I do think is at least kind of interesting, which is is the American re- Revolution really a revolution um when you compare it to the other political revolutions in history, like 
the Russian Revolution, um, the French Revolution, you know, that that seem more violent and uh, dramatic, where there's huge upending of society, where, I mean, there's just completely a disconnect between what came before and, and what came after. And um, some people point to the American Revolution and say, it's not really that much of a revolution. It's just simply a, a secession or an independence war. Mm. And, you know, beyond that, there's, there's not much change. And then there are people who say, no, it definitely was a revolution. There's just, you know, various factors why uh, it never turned quite as violent as the French Revolution, let alone the Russian Revolution. And, um, you know, where, where I came down on it, because I, I had a few spots in my revolution series where I talked about that question is basically kind of that it, it, it was a revolution, but it was not, it was not a complete revolution like that. It, it didn't quite live up to the potential that it had. Um, and, and there's a variety of reasons for this. And part of it is because the, the pro independence faction was never unified on what exactly the revolution was supposed to be for. There, there was the more kind of conservative group who simply wanted to uh, kick out the British and have a homegrown American elite essentially running a system very similar mm. to, to what the British ran with mercantilism mm. and a very powerful central government and all this sort of thing. Um, and just kind of give it a veneer of republicanism, you know, call the guy a president instead of a king. Mm. Um, and, and this is the faction of, of people like George Washington, um, Alexander Hamilton, Robert Morris, um, the, these sorts of characters. And, and then there were the ones who uh, cert certainly were flawed um, from, from you know, our perspective, but were better. The sort of Thomas Jefferson crowd, um, the, the more, by the standards of the time, the more uh, radical, the more kind of libertarian-ish, um, who thought, you know, the revolution isn't just about changing, ex exchanging some, some British oppressors for some American oppressors. Um, that it was supposed to be about something more significant than that, really about you know trying to liberate the individual. And um, un unfortunately, uh, for the most part in the long term, the, the Washington, Robert Morris, Hamilton faction basically won. Uh, they, they did have periodic setbacks uh, over the years, but, but in, the, in the long term of American history, they did win. Yeah, and... Um yeah, and I guess Patrick Henry would be considered with with Thomas Jefferson, right? With that. Yeah, for the most part, I I think, and and I I have to say, um, I'm not quite as familiar with him as I am with some of the others. Oh, yeah. um, with his with his sort of post post war career, I think towards the end of his political career, he he became a bit more um, of of the conservative type, mm -hmm. um, and had a little bit more sympathy with the Federalist. Um, I could be wrong about that, but. That, that's just my recollection. But certainly uh, at the time of the Revolutionary War, he was one of those radicals. He was one of those people that really thought the revolution was supposed to be about something uh, besides just the zip code of, of who's collecting your taxes. <laughs> yeah, and, and also what really um, impressed me was when, when you were mentioning how the people, you know, um, what various groups of people, how they, their lives were affected before the revolution and afterwards. <laughs> and, yeah. and how most people um most people had no change or were worse off <laughs> yeah after the revolution <laughs> yeah yeah a lot a lot of people were and you know this is one of the the insights I, I give credit to some of the new left historians uh people like howard zinn and, and mm. william appleman williams and others and I, and I did a an episode a long time ago about three leftist historians that every libertarian ought to read. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, just because we, we wouldn't necessarily agree with them on everything and we wouldn't agree with them on, you know, their prescriptions for economic policies, mm -hmm. uh, doesn't mean they're not dead on right about some things and doesn't mean they don't have uh, lots of important insights uh, to offer. Murray Rothbard was a fan of a lot of these new left historians. And, um, you know, kind of like what I was saying before about, you look back at, at uh, Alexander the Great and only look at the, at the ruler's, he looks like this great guy doing all these wonderful things. And you look at the perspective of the average person, the small farmer, the slave, just the, the, the sort of random citizen. And uh, it's, it's a little bit more complicated. 
Well, same thing with the American Revolution. If you bother to look at uh, the, the situation for slaves, the situation for Native Americans and so on, it's, it's really problematic. And even some of the, the poor white folks you know, on the frontier in a lot of areas were worse off uh, after the revolution than they were before. <laughs> yeah, right. And, and uh, I guess that leads into the, uh, uh, the Shays Rebellion it ha- happened before, right? Before the Whiskey Rebellion? Yeah, Shays Rebellion was first. Shays Rebellion was um, actually before the writing of the Constitution oh. when, when the country was still governed by the Articles of Confederation. And it was basically in uh, western frontier counties of Massachusetts. And um, you had a lot of people there who were um, war veterans who were in bad economic uh, situations, largely not their own fault, largely because of of their military service. And a lot of them had ended up in debt. And then the the state government of Massachusetts instituted a bunch of policies that, in a variety of ways, made things even more difficult for those people. Hmm. And uh, that that privileged a lot of the eastern elites in in the big cities like Boston, and so you had a lot of people who who had real serious grievances. These were not you know just lazy people sitting around saying give me bailouts and give me welfare. These mm. these were you know veterans of the revolution, hardworking farmers in the in the frontier, and they tried to work through the system and they tried to get certain reforms they thought might help them. Um, but the the state government in Boston was totally rigged against them, and uh, the governor was very hostile to them. And so eventually a, a, a group of these people uh, rose up in rebellion, um, starting off not really violent, kind of uh, shutting down courthouses and things like that, not, not really you know, going out and sniping people. Mm. But then, then it started to escalate, and eventually the governor sent in um, a massive military force and um, – there, there were a few little battles and things, and uh, and the rebellion fizzled out. And unfortunately, a lot of the rebels were not very well armed, hmm. and um, because they were so broke, you know, uh, Daniel Shays himself, who was one of the leaders of the rebellion, who had been a Revolutionary War captain, uh, was so broke right after the war. A lot of these guys served in the war for like five years and hardly ever got paid the whole hmm. time. Yeah, didn't they get paid in uh, in bonds, right? Just uh, was, yeah, yeah. It, basically, it like the Continentals. The, the um, I think they they got paid in Continentals for a while, and then the Congress st- eventually stopped printing them because the inflation was so bad. Yeah, <laughs> and then they were basically given them IOUs, kind of like a like a weird form of a bond that wasn't wasn't like a normal bond where somebody actually like lent the government money, which is sort of the government printed an IOU, <laughs> mm-hmm. and um, and so a lot of these guys were so desperate during and after the war that they they traded those for like pennies on the dollar because mm. nobody thought they were worth anything. Mm. And then most of these end up in the hands of wealthy speculators who then get the ear of the state and basically the state comes in and says, okay, we're going to make those things get paid. We're going to you know collect the taxes. Mm. And so in a lot of cases, the, the, very, the very speculator that um, – you know, bought your bond for for pennies on the dollar. Now is demanding it get paid full face value with interest by taxing you, and also is the same guy who, if you go totally broke and lose your farm, is going to swoop in and uh, and buy your your farm at a at a fire sale price. Mm. Now y- you could see to like a a hardened combat veteran <laughs> that I mean we we've seen the Rambo movies, right? I mean mm-hmm. you can only push. An angry you can only screw angry veterans so much until you're playing with fire um and and that was Daniel Shays and a lot of these people who joined him and um they they put him down brutally. One of the things that that surprised me when I first came across it was uh Samuel Adams, who we normally think of as being part of the sort of radical revolutionary faction, and he certainly was during the war against the British, but then uh once independence was done. He became a big time status, uh, specifically for the state of Massachusetts. He was kind of an anti federalist when it came to the federal government, but he thought, you know, I'm, I'm a citizen of the Republic of Massachusetts, and uh, it's one thing to disobey the laws of a monarchy, that's good, but uh, to disobey a republic is evil. Mm. He was calling for all sorts of horrific punishments and the death penalty and everything for all the rebels. Mm. Um, he, he literally drafted a riot act that that had all these punishments for anybody who was joining in the rebellion. 
Um, so he he's a great example of of somebody who, you know, in one instance is is this great you know hero for liberty, and then all of a sudden the next day is is a, is a complete uh, cheerleader for the state. And uh, uh, Lou from Feed- Freedom Fiends. I don't, I don't know if you if you yeah. know uh, Lou. Lou Fiend, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. He he put it uh, r- really funny uh, to me once. He said, "You should do a a dangerous history frenemies on <laughs> Samuel Adams, right? DHP frenemies. Um, <laughs> nice. And a good guy, good guy one day, bad bad guy the next. Right, right, right. Wow, amazing. Huh? <clears throat> yeah, yeah. I, I remember learning about uh, when, when I started. Um, you know, learning about um, Austrian economics, I I read the book um, Creature from Jekyll Island, right? G. Edward yep. Griffin, and I learned an amazing amount of stuff uh, from that on history, and um, and and yeah, and and also a couple of documentaries. But yeah, referencing how you know gold and silver is in the original Constitution, um, and how you know the uh, not worth a continental <laughs> the, that that phrase you know originated at that time period, and and how and and the reason why they put gold and silver in the Constitution was because they were so afraid of hyperinflation, they knew the dangers of paper money at that time of, of fiat currency, and and uh, and so they were, I guess, able to stave it off for a few a few uh, decades. When uh, and then it, what it came back, I think, in uh, in the um, during Lincoln's time, right, the the War of Northern Aggression, in, well, with the greenbacks. Or? Yeah, yeah, that was that was the next time there was a lot of paper money, right. and you know, some of some of the anti Federal Reserve crowd. I'm sure you've you've run into this. Mm-hmm. Some of the anti Federal Reserve crowd love the greenbacks. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. I, 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 yeah, like, um, like, yeah, like uh, the resource based economy people. You know, they talk about the yeah, yeah. how Lincoln did the greenbacks, and it was wonderful because the government <laughs> controlled it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and kind of sort funny. of sort of like the Lyndon Larouche type people. Yeah. Um, you know, or so or some of the people that go go a bit bit further than I'm willing to to be comfortable with uh with some of the conspiracy theories like <laughs> you know I'm I I I'm in an awkward place because I'm basically I'm a moderate conspiracy theorist you know <laughs> I, that, that, which is a tough place to be in uh-huh. right because on the one hand you know you think the mainstream is full of it but on the other hand there's all these people that you know go to crazy town <laughs> on the conspiracies and i'm and i'm awkwardly in the middle like well some of these are kind of true but a lot of them aren't true and you know some of them are sort of true but you go like 10 steps too far um over the rainbow you know yeah There's a lot of people like that out there yeah like um uh yeah i, I remember reading about those like the the reptilian uh you know shapeshifters and then and then like even even chemtrails i mean i mean you, you know I, the way i look at it is like we have enough wickedness and evil and predation and violence <laughs> that we know about that is done out in the open <laughs> and victimizing you know of innocent people that it's not necessary to make up all of these stories like then you got to research your facts and you know where are you getting information from and you know it's just not necessary you know we, we know yeah. what the incentives are of having power of of having you know uh, a secured income through taxation right through the theft of taxation we know that that perverts incentives there's no need to conjure up more ghosts and demons <laughs> to be angry about yeah it. yeah which which is why in my podcast I, I try to stick to the ones that like there's no question uh, mm. in terms of conspiracies and and when I don't have total proof I admit that I say you know I, I'm kind of suspicious about this and that this mm. You know, thing over here makes me wonder, but on the other hand, like to me, the burden of proof for a really elaborate conspiracy should be pretty high. Mm. You know, so so I'm I'm willing to I'm willing to deal with things like um, MK Ultra because we know it's real. Mm. I'm willing to deal with things like uh, the radiation experiments done on done on unwitting American participants. Uh, in the early Cold War, because those are real. Those are you know, like we have ironclad proof for all that stuff. Um, y- you don't need to have shape shifting lizard Rothschild people, um, <laughs> you know, performing uh, magic that actually works um, in order to have some pretty nasty things being done by the people in power. Right. I mean, I mean, I always tell people that we have more in common with the average Iraqi an afghan person than we have with our own political masters you know um and th- they don't they don't have to be lizards for us to recognize that they're different <laughs> you know that's yeah yeah pass, you know yeah 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 i think definitely a higher there's higher rates of sociopathy among among 
um, politicians and the higher they are up the totem pole, the higher the rates probably are. And, you know, if somebody wants to say the reptilian thing is a metaphor and, you know, I don't want to get on the, get on this rabbit hole too much, but <laughs> if somebody wants to say it's just a metaphor, then, then I think that's fine. But, right. but that's not how, that's not how some people, um, <laughs> present it and talk about it, you right, know? Right. And every, every now and then I'll, I'll get an email or something about somebody, somebody asking me to cover something, um, that, you know, I just have to kind of politely say like, yeah, no, because, <laughs> because it's, it's something that, that, um, that I either, I, I already know is false or mm. I, I look at it and I go for a minute like, oh, that's kind of interesting. And 15 minutes of research and I'm just no way. I mean, it's just, it's just outlandish. So yeah, some, some of the greenback crowd are, are sort of that way. You know, they're the people who, are correct in the Federal Reserve being bad mm-hmm. uh, and being a, the result of essentially a bankster conspiracy. Mm-hmm. But then a lot of them, their solution is like, yeah, so if we just had Congress printing up paper money at will, that would be great. <laughs> Which, right, right. That's out of the frying pan into the fire, maybe. I mean, I mean, even the word conspiracy, you know, I, I tell people, like, what, what is the definition of the word conspiracy? Is it's a couple of people getting together and planning something, <laughs> right? So when I see a, a commercial, you know, on YouTube or on TV, that's a conspiracy to get me, a couple of people getting together, making something to have, you know, so I can believe or, or alter my perception, right? Um or, yeah, when you get together with your friends, <laughs> you conspire to get together. But uh, it has this negative connotation. Um, so, yeah, and then the other thing is, like you said, if it's true, it's not a conspiracy. It's just truth, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, it, sometimes I wonder, um, some of the more goofy out there conspiracy theory stuff, I wonder how many of the people who are pushing that stuff are, are just like working for the government in one way or another. Right. Like, you know, are they, are they COINTELPRO basically out there, um, to, to put out this ridiculous stuff to discredit by association mm. people who are actually raising legitimate questions and are sticking to what the evidence actually shows. And, mm-hmm. you know, because you think about it from the government's perspective and, and there's some writings by, um, who the heck was the, uh, Obama's information czar. What the heck? What the heck's his name? He's a professor at like Harvard or someplace. Oh yeah. Um, I'm blanking out on the guy's name. He actually wrote a paper, um, like published in academic journals back before before Obama was president, uh, essentially saying that the government should discredit conspiracy theorists by basically putting out its own conspiracy theories that were so ridiculous mm. that they would discredit anybody who raised any questions about the official narrative of anything. And, um, you know, sometimes you got to wonder, because you can certainly understand how from, from their perspective, it would be great to be able to discredit anybody, to smear anybody mm-hmm. who, who raises any, any serious questions about, you know, the system or the official stories of any of the wars or things like that. It'd be great to just, you know, say they're all crazy tinfoil hat people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like, so, it, it kind of reminds me of uh, Edward, Edward Bernays, I think, wrote the book, Right Propaganda?, and, yeah. and and that was actually um, it was picked up and read by um, Joseph Goebbels Goebbels from uh, yeah, the, yeah, Nazi, so. the Nazi the minister of propaganda <laughs> right, right right and and uh, and how that's used to alter perception and um, and it's so true you know like um, you know it's not it's not um, unrealistic to think that um, that there would be um, you know I guess undercover agents or trolls online you know under various posts and trying to you know yeah. Put in yeah, dubious I mean, we, remarks. We, know, we know they've done it before. Um, you know, COINTELPRO mm-hmm. eventually got out all, all that stuff where they were infiltrating groups back in the 50s and 60s and 70s. Mm-hmm. And there was something that came out not that long ago, I think within the past year or two, mm-hmm. um, where, and I don't remember if it was the Snowden leaks that showed this or what, but something came out that showed that the Pentagon was actually hiring people to set up phony social media accounts and and basically go on there and troll like that's your tax right. your tax right. dollars at work right. are are trolling people who are mm-hmm. you know questioning the official narrative and in some cases it, i think it was people who were pretending like they were you know conspiracy theorists or whatever and just doing ridiculous stuff mm-hmm. um to discredit somebody else who maybe was not as over the rainbow 
uh, <laughs> crazy in their theories. You know, <laughs> just get them guilt by association. Right, right, right. So, so let me ask you. Um, so I haven't listened to many episodes, but um, I, I get the feeling that many of your episodes are on um, U.S. history. Right, I think you do. Yeah. Have, right, you do have other, um, you know, uh, from other countries, uh, because one thing that I was really interested in that I, I read a lot about, because I'm I'm half Peruvian, half Australian, right? So, mm. so I I was re- really fascinated with Inca culture, right, and the Inca Empire mm. and the history of that, and mm. I read a book um, called The Last of the Incas, and it told you know just told the story about how their rise, that empire was built. And, and, you know, how they, basically very similar to the Roman Empire, you know, it gobbled up all these small tribes and, yeah. um, you know, forcing them to, um, you know, subjugating them and forcing them to learn the uh, Quechua language, which was the, the Inca language at the time, and uh, pay tribute to the Sapa Inca, the, uh, the sun god king. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, do, do you know any, have you studied any of this history at all or do you plan do you plan to do or have yeah yeah i i might cover some of that stuff actually i mean i i cover it um not in enormous detail but i do cover it in world history okay um the uh, the the book you mentioned, I I think, is one that actually is on my Amazon wish list. Is it <laughs> uh, right now? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I, I think it's one that that I've cool. heard of and and thought, cool. oh, that's a good one. And of oh, course, yeah. my Amazon wish list is ever just, growing, ever growing. Oh, it's ridiculous. <laughs> the list of books to read, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, one one of the great things about my podcast is um, because of Amazon affiliate sales. You know, I get some Amazon credit every month. People nice. people buy stuff from from going through my links, nice. uh, which I hugely appreciate because basically it feeds my reading for the show. <laughs> so Excellent. you know, it it allows me every month when I get that credit, I can buy Excellent. another giant pile of history books <laughs> that can then go into making making future episodes. And uh, yeah, that 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 book is actually one I've recently put in there. Um, I'm I'm a bit more familiar with the Aztecs okay. than than with the Incas um, a, as of right now, but yeah, a lot of those um, you know Native American empires mm-hmm. um, are are just fascinating because they they completely blow holes in the stereotype that a lot of a lot of North Americans have that like all of the indigenous peoples of the new world were all these sort of peaceful hippie types, mm, you know, who right, just right. wanted to smoke uh, peyote or, you know, take peyote and smoke <laughs> be, the peace pipe and, and be one commune with, nature, with the great or, spirit. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They're just, they're just basically hippies, you know. Right. Um, and, and man, the, the Inca, the, the Aztecs, um, the Mayans, you know, they completely destroy that stereotype. <laughs> I mean, they're they're conquering their their fellow Indians uh, quite yeah. <laughs> quite brutally, right. um, sacrificing them you know mm-hmm. by the by the mm-hmm. truckload. Yeah, and um, and it's you know it's another one of those interesting stories where you can see the intersection of of power and ideas, mm-hmm. where the the ruler is not just saying obey me because I have a I have a bunch of guys who will enforce my will. It's I've got that and. And I'm also whatever in communication with the gods, or mm. I'm the mm. incarnation of of one of the gods, or right. what have you. Right. Um, and and that's always very interesting stuff to me. Um, I I always tend to approach it from a cynical point of view, <laughs> and um, you know, not to say that I don't think any of those those rulers believe that stuff. I'm sure some of them really did believe it, but mm. at a certain point, at, at a certain point, when you're looking at somebody's ideology, it gets. Sometimes it's just like really, really, you you believe that that's so convenient. That's <laughs> know, right? so convenient to what you're trying to do here. You know? um, right. It, it's you know Genghis Khan thought, oh yeah, the gods have given me the world to rule. Well, isn't that convenient? You know? <laughs> Happened nice. to be you. Yeah, it's nice. It's nice to be the king. Right? Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Like you said, um, you know, you know, shattering the, uh, the, you know, the hippie native uh, myth is like, yeah, with the Incas, you know, where they have the uh, virgins of the sun and, you know, you, you know, human sacrifice as well as the Aztecs. Right. Um, and I think I think in Peru, in the Andes uh, mountains, they, they, they discovered like, um, you know, well-preserved um, young virgin uh, women bodies, mm. you know, like like really well-preserved, like the hair is, is still there. It's, it's really amazing. Um, but, um, but yeah, it's just fascinating to learn about that stuff and how, um, like there's these people, the Chaskis, which are the, the runners 
you know, like like they would run like marathons frequently, <laughs> like just getting um, fresh food from the was it the Pacific Ocean all the way up to Cusco, which is the which is the capital of the Inca Empire, where the where the Sapa Inca was. So so bringing him fresh <laughs> fresh food, yeah. these relay runners, and they would be running, and and they would know that they would that they really ran long distances because after examining their skeletons they would notice how worn out their knees were. <laughs> yeah. It's fascinating stuff. Yeah, the the Inca are, are so interesting. Um it's one of the reasons I have wanted to look into them more. One one of the reasons I find them just so so interesting and, and unusual is the logistics of where they were. Like literally some of the most rugged mountains on planet earth right, yeah. and they're running an empire in that like <laughs> that is you don't find many empires that are in rugged mountains usually right. rugged mountains is where states kind of lose their grip a little bit mm -hmm. you know like if you if you read something like the art of not being governed mm -hmm. uh by james scott you know a, a lot of areas the mountains is where the state can't at least in pre-modern times can't really mm -hmm. uh, exert a lot of control mm -hmm. but um you know the Incas were able to do it and mm. and do it in a in like real rugged mountains too. Yeah. Um. And and all the logistics of how they ran their empire and and the food and everything, and um, you know they're one of the few empires that wasn't based on grain, that that was based on potato, mm. which is another thing that's, you know, just kind of different. I mean, most of the other, um, you know, pre-modern empires in the world are based on on one or more forms of grain. Mm. Um, it's actually an episode I'm I'm working on the notes for still. I'm going to try and record it in the next few days. Um, an episode I'm going to do called "Grains in the State," uh, sim <laughs> simply about the historical linkages between wow. grains in the state and cool. and why states tend to like grains. Um, they <laughs> they funny. tend to institute policies that um, favor grains over other you know forms of of food. Um, which if you just look at the U.S. Department of Agriculture today, right, what are the crops they subsidize and encourage the most? It's, it's wheat, it's corn, and it's soybeans, mm. you know, which actually are, I think, a form of grain. Mm. So, yeah. So, so, so could it be because it's, it's easy to store? Like it has long that, shelf life? Like yeah, yeah, that's, that's part of it. Um, there's, a, there's a whole list of attributes just like how some substances function better as money than others just because of certain inherent attributes, yeah, yeah. grain functions as, you know, state food. Mm. Um, yeah, part of it is the shelf life. Part of it is um, that it, it, it ties people down geographically, mm -hmm. right? If you're, if you're growing rice or weed or whatever, like you're not mobile. Mm -hmm. um, and that makes you easier to keep track of. It makes yeah. you easier to tax, to, to you know, take information in the census and whatever hmm. um it makes it easy for the tax man to know where to look right grains hmm. you know they they usually all come to uh fruition at the same time hmm. um it's easy for the tax guy to show up and confiscate what he wants whereas if you're i don't know a hunter gatherer or you're practicing a more kind of uh varied form of agriculture and and that sort of thing it's a it's just a lot harder for them to keep track of you and to come take your stuff. Mm -hmm. um, if you're growing nothing but uh, yucca plants, what are they going to do? Send an army of guys to literally dig up all the ground around where you are to find all of your yucca? <laughs> I mean, it's <laughs> right. way more trouble than it's worth. Right. But if you've got a giant field of corn or something, it's pretty easy. <laughs> oh, fascinating, fascinating. Yeah, and another fascinating thing about the Incas I remember learning was that uh, their system for uh, recor recording... Um, yeah, population, you know, food stores, um, basically archives, I guess, historical archives, information, right? Um, and, and they use this thing called the um, quipus. Um, it's, uh, I, th I think the way they, they translate it is Q-U-I-P-O. Q and it's because um, they, they didn't have a written system at all. It was, a, it was this series of knots in rope. Mm. <laughs> and it was a, it's a fascinating thing because they, they were able to construct this elaborate way of transmitting information through these ropes, right? Um, and like, you know, depending on, you know, what kind of rope they're using and then if they intertwine the rope with a different thing, like let's, let's say if we in, intertwine it with sheep wool, then it would mean, you know, something pertaining to sheep or, and then there's different knots and the, the length of, you know, how the knots um, 
uh, how in intermittent they were or how large or small they were that trans <laughs> different information and so they would you know of course these chaskis would take you know they would run that you know back and forth and this would be like the uh, you know the uh, the circulation networks right the i get the you know the usps transmitting information mm. and oh my god and so one the one thing that um that the spaniards did to to um, um kind of um break down their level of communication was to destroy their stores of information destroy that history mm. and so they would burn down these areas where they accumulated all these um th these you know system of ropes and knots and that's mm. one way they broke down their cohesion right 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 so uh yeah so re really really fascinating stuff um and I think I read that book like two or three times. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm, you know? I'm I'm looking forward to reading it. And those um, I, I'm more familiar with just sort of the stories of the Spanish conquests of, of a lot of those groups. Okay. And I always just find it um, just just interesting and complicated because I can't figure out who to root for. <laughs> because mm. on, on the one hand, a lot of these a lot of these people were were pretty nasty. You know, imperial conquerors themselves, right? Yeah, yeah. and then on on the other hand, then then in come the Spaniards like a bull in a china shop, right? Um, <laughs> you know, messing things up and right. and um, you know, and a lot of times putting a stop to some bad stuff. Like the Spaniards typically put a stop to the practice of human sacrifice. Yeah, but uh, then you know they they did horrible things themselves, and they they brought in diseases, and you know destroyed cultures, and and created mm. all all this chaos and and destruction, right? Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know. I think that goes back to the idea of, um, like, you know, talking about World War II, right? And Hitler and everybody like generally accepts the idea that Hitler was an evil guy, right? He's the embodiment of sure. evil. He's the incarnation of evil. You can't get any more evil than Hitler. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's amazing how quickly people forget or discount the, um, the history of, of wicked ad acts in our own country perpetrated by our own government right sure. and and they quickly jump jump over them well hitler was more evil <laughs> yeah and, and, and it's not like that it's not like it's not like you know a good versus evil it's like this evil guy fights this evil guy <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. this evil guy has a little more firepower, so that's why he wins. But nobody's yeah. really good. <laughs> that's why. Yeah, I look at it. yeah, exactly. And and no one would accept those sorts of alibis in just sort of individual life. Like if you were a serial killer who had maybe only killed five people, and then you got caught. Mm -hmm. Like no one would accept it as a valid legal defense if you went into court and said, "Listen, <laughs> yeah, I've murdered five people, but who hasn't?" There's more. And <laughs> secondly. I know dozens of guys who have killed 20, 30, 40 people. So, right. you know, really you should just give me a, a pat on the back and let me go. You know. <laughs> no one would accept that. But, but when it comes to, um, comes to the rulers, then they have the, the Stockholm syndrome kicking in and it turns into, well, you know, my ruler is, uh, marginal, marginally less of a criminal <laughs> than, uh, the, than the one over there. So therefore mine is good. Right. Know? It reminds me of a, of a Larkin Rose video. Uh, it's called um, "What's So Bad About the Nazis," and and he yeah. <laughs> he poses. To, did you see this one? I, I have not. I'll have to check right. it out. Yeah, he, he poses a serious question. He's like, "This is not a rhetorical question. What is so bad about the Nazis? What did the Nazis do? That's really hard." And then they're going like, "Well, they killed a bunch of people. All right, <laughs> the Native American genocide." <laughs> chain slavery um <laughs> you know internment of japanese americans italian americans german americans uh what, <laughs> should i continue yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and it's like what else well they had an evil flag well so the piece of fabric that's what made them evil <laughs> like you can't really yeah. say what they did was more evil than us because it's not true <laughs> or or even it, talk about the hiroshima and nagasaki right how many innocent yeah, people yeah. died with that yeah yeah and and also keep in mind i mean which country arguably did more of the job of beating Hitler than anyone else by far, it was Stalin's Soviet Union. You know, that the, the Red Army did, a, did like 80 to 90% of the work of actually crushing uh, the German army in World War II. You know, any, any historian who's an expert on, on uh, World War II, the European theater of war, will tell you that. And so e even if you want to make an argument that like, okay, um, Hitler killed millions of people in a relatively short amount of time. That's just simply a, a larger magnitude than than you know what was happening in the United States. Mm. 
then you still have the problem of, okay, but the country that did more of the work of beating Hitler than anybody else was Stalin's Soviet Union, which <laughs> like was equivalent to, to Nazi Germany in the magnitude of, of how many people they were killing in a short amount of time, you know. In, in the 30s is when Stalin was doing uh, his, his purges and his show trials and was, you know, deliberately starving out Ukraine and, you know, all these things that are, that are right there right, right. Um, in, in terms of, of size of the atrocities. But, um, you know, th those were the years during World War II. That was when he was Uncle Joe. Right. right? That, that was <laughs> when like, Time Magazine is, is saying he's a great guy and he likes, uh, he likes to sing opera and, and he likes American novels and, you know. Yeah, I think Hitler was also, right? Time Magazine uh, um, spoke for one year. Yeah, yeah, Man of, year. Right, Man of the Year. Right, Man Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, back in the late 30s. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's a great documentary. I don't know if you checked it out. It's called, I think it's called The History of Gold. And uh, it focused on, especially like in World War II, and what role did gold play in World War II and, and which countries Hitler chose to invade and why? And uh, and a lot of it was due to um, the fact that he was broke, right? And he, he needed he needed money to fund his whatever he wanted to do. And uh, and I think his accountant, when his accountant told him, he's like, "Sir, you're, you're, we're broke." So he shot his accountant, and then he got a new one, and he got a new guy. And the guy's like, "Let's invade these countries. They have gold. Let's get their gold." And so and so he started invading, and uh, and and yeah, and then I think when they, by the time they got to France, like France knew they were coming for the gold, so they they hid the they hid the gold, scattered it in the countryside, and then eventually they they started like sh putting like massive amount of gold bars on ships and shipping it to. Um, to Canada and the United States, which was neutral at that time, right in the war, and and so and, and a lot of those ships got sunk by German U-boats. So, mm. so 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 much of this shipwrecked gold lies still at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> have you have you seen this? Have you, have you, have you no, heard about no, this, this story? No, I have not. No. Yeah, yeah, it's fascinating. And and there's actually um, a um, uh, a business that their main focus is to excavate and find these ships with these gold bars and they that they, something like they only go for ships that have like something like 50 million dollars because it's so expensive to do what they do right. and, and dive so deep as as they do that they need to be compensated <laughs> sure you know by, by, for, the, by for what they do and that basically i guess the same reason that the roman empire fell was or one of the reasons was that um, with Hitler that he overextended himself and he kept thinking, oh, I can invade this country, invade that country, invade that country. And then finally he gets to Russia and people just retreat into Siberia, right? <laughs> and just like start or, or just... Yeah. They couldn't stand yeah. the, cold, the cold, right? Something like that? Yeah, the, the cold and, and the sheer size and right, all that. Right. I mean, you know, lo logistics are, are real. <laughs> and, yeah, yeah. Um, I wish some of America's recent rulers would remember this and, mm -hmm. you know, not do dumb stuff like uh, start long-term uh, major ground wars in Afghanistan, <laughs> you know, yeah, places yeah. like this where you'd think if you had sort of passed world history 101, you would know there are just parts of the world that are a real pain in the ass to, to try to occupy and, and that imperialism never really works long-term. Because there's there's no there's no example of an empire that's around today that's been around for you know centuries and centuries or or millennia, mm -hmm. um, but it, everybody everybody thinks their empire is going to be different. Everybody <laughs> thinks, oh yeah, right. no, ours is the one that's going to go on forever and just always be <laughs> awesome and and never go broke and never overextend itself and never fall apart. Um, you know, the Romans thought that, mm -hmm. you know, everybody, everybody thinks that not that long ago, the British thought that, mm -hmm. um, that was, that was the main thing I studied in grad school was British empire. And I'm still thinking about, um, you know, in the future, maybe doing a massive, uh, mini series on the, the centuries of history of the British empire on my podcast, just to finally, finally have some use for all that grad school learning I did. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the British, same deal. They, they thought they were, they thought they were special. They thought they were, you know, some, some form of basically a master race, mm. um, or at the very least that their civilization was superior. Right. And, and they thought, yeah, of course, you know, the sun never sets on the British empire and it never will. <laughs> um, and they all end up in the same place. You know, they all end up on the, on the garbage can of history. Um, but you know, now the neocons think that America is just going to, going to be the internal uh, empire. Right.
Well, um, I don't want to keep you any longer, but uh, before we go, I just want to uh, ask you, uh, you know, what I ask everybody. Uh, well, first of all, what's, your, what's your, one of your favorite quotes, like all, all-time favorite quotes? Um, oh, I got a lot, but uh, one of my favorites right now, I mean, you know, there's about a, about 100 Mencken quotes, but uh, <laughs> one of my favorites right now is uh, from Edward Abbey, um, the, the novelist and, and American anarchist of the 20th century. And, uh, the quote is something along the lines of, uh, anarchism is not some high minded idealism, but the hard headed realization that we can't leave our, let our lives be run by priests, generals, Kings, and County commissioners. All right. So Excellent. yeah, I've, I've got, I've got it on my office wall at work, so I could have quoted it exactly, but I don't <laughs> have it here at home. So, no worries. <laughs> Excellent quote. I really love that one. Um, so, so before we go, um, like if 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 you had to, you know, talk to somebody and try to explain to them um, why you think knowing history is important to their life and relevant, why they should study it, what what would you say to the person? Yeah, that and that's a good question and and one that people always sort of have, especially when they're told they have to take a history class whether they want to or not. <laughs> is you know when am I going to use this right? right? Like we all like we all said about calculus, <laughs> um, but when it comes to history, I think it's not. What a lot of people say is that you need to know history so that we can avoid the mistakes of the past. Okay, and of course. First question with that is, who's this we you're talking about, right? <laughs> what's what's this you know fuzzy collective that you're talking about? Mm. Um, are are you a king? Are you a president? You know who who are you to be saying we? I, I'm not a decision maker who's telling the state what to do. Yeah. Um, but but secondly, the the reality is that decent people almost never find themselves in a position of real power, and uh, other than occasionally by just complete accident. And that was more common in the days of, of monarchy. Like you might accidentally get a get a prince who's a decent guy, and then becomes king, and like isn't that bad? Mm. Um, but but in general, the tendency is people who find them themselves in positions of power uh, tend to be just simply the most effective and ruthless uh, psychopaths and sociopaths. Mm -hmm. And so the the hope that you're going to somehow e learn history and either become a politician or get a politician's ear. And persuade them to not do the stupid and evil things those people always tend to do, uh, to me is is just completely unrealistic. And and so to me, the answer I would give is more along the lines of um, stupid and evil people always tend to find their way into positions of power where they tend to do things that are stupid or evil or both. <laughs> and um, you know, other than maybe long, long, long term, uh, trying to convince enough people to to not want to be ruled and to actually want to be free. Um, other than that long-term project um, in the short term, there's, there's really no hope that that sort of thing isn't going to keep happening. Mm. You know, it's, it's like living in a hurricane zone and, and thinking that, well, you know, we can just uh, somehow persuade hurricanes to not, not hit us. <laughs> it's not going to happen. Right. <laughs> so if you live in a hurricane prone area and assuming for whatever reason you want to keep living there, um, you don't, you don't try to persuade the hurricanes to go away you say, okay, this stuff is going to happen from time to time. And um, sort of what are just some rational things that I can do to try and as much as possible, you know, pr protect myself um, and my family and, and kind of figure out how to um, accommodate myself to, to these, these forces um, the best I can so that I don't get steamrolled, right? And, and so to, to take an extreme example, admittedly an extreme example, but to illustrate the point, um, if you were a Jew in Germany in, I don't know, 1935, you would be wasting your time and probably throwing away your life if you said, well, I'm a German, this is my country, and I'm just going to stay here and try and work within the system and persuade my leaders to, <laughs> to like Jews more or whatever, right? right. Um, the, the rational thing would be to get the hell out if at all possible, right? Yeah. Um, and so, you know, that's obviously an, a, a, an extreme case. Um, but to, to illustrate the point that to me, history above all else is in a way a form of kind of self-defense so that you can know what kind of stupid and evil crap they're likely to do. <laughs> and, um, you know, you can't, 
you can't avoid avoid all of the problems they're going to cause. Obviously, if our if our leaders decide to be stupid enough to I don't know try and start a war with Russia or something, um, that's going to have negative consequences that we probably can't all dodge. Mm-hmm. But um, you know, th- there are things that you can learn to help you um, empower yourself and protect yourself um, as much as possible. That that I don't think you could do if you were ignorant of history. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's kind of like I guess uh, int- intellectual self defense. Really. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And and one one way I like to look at history is, um, you know, people say that history repeats itself. Um, but to add to that, it's like um, you know, you change change the names and change um, the faces and the costumes, but the storyline seems to <laughs> repeat itself over and over and over again. Yeah, yeah. Somebody, I think it might have been John Adams. Um, who who did occasionally say a brilliant thing every now and then, even though I typically don't like him. <laughs> but um, I think it was John Adams who supposedly said, uh, "History is philosophy teaching by example." So that's hmm. that's another benefit. Is it's sort of like, you know, if like me, you're you're too stupid to figure out, you know, proper ethics and and things like the non-aggression principle simply in the realm of pure abstract philosophy mm-hmm. um you know i didn't i didn't figure it out there i figured it out by looking at history and so history's philosophy teaching by example i, I think is is just another path mm-hmm. just another path that that works for some people um you know to get them where you know you and i think anyway is the right place to be All right yeah yeah and, and uh just just to finish off for, for me um my favorite uh, i think one of my favorite history quotes is napoleon bonaparte i think he said history is a a pack of lies agreed upon right yep <laughs> yep <laughs> yep yep it's pretty much you know what what the people in power decide they want you to think mm-hmm. and um that's sort of most mainstream history obviously not the kind of stuff that i do right. on <laughs> on my show i pretty much try to do the opposite right 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 so so before you go please plug um you know all the ways people can reach you if they want to find your work uh sure uh my website is profcj.org and um you can also find my podcast on on uh, Stitcher on iTunes um if you just put in dangerous history podcast you'll probably find it um i am also on twitter and facebook as well uh, there there's links to those on my website um or you know just go on facebook and put uh, dangerous history podcast or prof cj or something like that and you'll get it uh and same thing with with twitter i think on twitter my handle is profcj.org like spelled out like d-o-t-o-r-g oh, um okay. at at profcj.org all spelled out in words okay. um just because that's what that's what twitter had available when i was setting it up nice. so <laughs> well somebody took anyway. prof cj and, and the dot that pre- <laughs> somebody took that from yeah you? oh my god you see that <laughs> yeah 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 i had to spell out the dot see that Links you have to go to. to <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, it's the same reason my website is dot org because I it, at the time I got it anyway they didn't have dot com available. Uh, so. See that, and I'm sure his I'm sure he wasn't doing anything with his website the dot com guy. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, it's you know probably some random jerk just you know squatting on it. <laughs> well, awesome. Thank you very much, um, C Jake, for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Hey, uh, sure, it, it was a pleasure. So this is um, uh, so if you want to if you want to help out my show, please um, you can uh, help me out through um, Patreon, Bitcoin, or PayPal. Um, please help me out. I love having uh, fascinating guests like uh, like CJ here for uh, an enlightening conversations, and I really want to do more of it. And um, monetary compensation is always encouraged. <laughs> yes. Although I will continue to do it, nevertheless, but. Uh, my wife would be happy if I uh, <laughs> get a little compensation. So I'm sure you feel the same way, right? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> you still do it because it's a labor of love, though, right? Because you want to see a better world for your children and your grandchildren, right? So, yes, but getting a little money helps. Yes, definitely. <laughs> so um, thank you very much for listening, everybody. This is um, Peace Finarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network um, and thus ConsciousResistance.com and thus EasesOfLiberty.com. Wishing everyone have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye.